back. We're live. This is Think Tech. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy with the Energy Policy Forum. Wow, our flagship show on energy. And we have Mina Marita, my co-host. Hi, Mina. Hi, Jay. <laughs> nice to be here again. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we can't go on like this. People will start to talk. I know. <laughs> We have Dave Ralph, our principal guest, the Hawaii Automobile Deals Association, and a ferocious moderate. Thank you, Jay. You know, you wear your heart on your coat sleeve. What can I say? Yes, ferocious moderate, but neutral as the Easter Bunny. I, I, <laughs> don't pick sides. And, and I was telling you that I woke up on May 1st, and it was extraordinary. My wife pushed me out of bed, and she said, Jay, don't you know that this is Building Code Safety Month? Indeed it is. Indeed it is. That's Ramsey Brown, <laughs> Hawaii Energy, energy engineer. He's going to tell us about that. Well, we take for granted the importance of the safety and resilience of our buildings, and so I'm here to spread the word that the month of May is Building Code Safety Month. Um, and it's important for the safety of our communities, but also our economic growth. And with that, I want to say thank you to the governor, David Ige, for officially proclaiming May Building Code Safety Month, believe it or not. And uh, we're joining other states, great states in our union here with this movement. Uh, we brought a short video to show our viewers, and uh, let's check it out. Yeah, let's see what we got. It's an honor for me, uh, along with Lieutenant Governor Shan Tsutsui, to proclaim May 2017 as uh, Building Safety Month uh, all around the state. Building codes are meant uh, for two purposes. One is to protect the public from, um, for lack of a better term, fools who don't know any better um, how to do things. And the other one is to protect the general public from crooks who want to try and take advantage of them. And so building codes are minimum standards to achieve these uh, two goals. Hawaii Energy is a part of the, the State Building Code Council because with our march towards 100% clean energy, um, the quickest and cheapest way for us to get there is through energy efficiency. And one way to do that is to make sure our buildings are specified with the latest and greatest technologies that are not only cost effective, but also save us energy and really helps us get to our goal a lot faster. Ramsey, All right, back. hope you enjoyed the video. Yeah. So I mentioned community safety before the video started, and building codes apply to new construction as well as major renovations. And while buildings are only a small percentage, new buildings are a small percentage of the energy impact. They'll last for the next 30, 40, 50 years as long as this building is around. So it's most cost effective to go in at the beginning, make it as energy efficient and as safe as possible rather than coming back and retrofitting. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're, at the State Building Code Council. You know, if you talk to Howard Wake, he'll tell you that energy codes is the way to go. It'll save you a lot of money, save the state a lot of money in the future, and it'll also save us a lot of energy, which is where I come in, and we get to encourage positive economic growth. We get to help people make smarter energy decisions uh, about their energy management while construction projects are, are still on the drawing board, really. Yeah, yeah. So how is this? This is implementation of a better code. Yes. First you have to adopt the code. Yes. I know Howard works on that a lot out of DBED. Um, and then once you adopt the code, you've got to make sure that people are following it. So how do you how do you do that? What role does Hawaii Energy play in all of that a process? A significant role in compliance, really, with the code. Um, we like to free up Howard to go and look at the next iteration of the code 2018 version while we um, do a lot of outreach and training, a lot of education, um, even industry-specific training, so we get all of the HVAC, the air conditioning folks in one building, and all the lighting folks in one building, and show them the difference between the previous code and how the new um, controls and operations will affect their industry uh, and how they can meet the new code, really, to, to ensure compliance is there. It's an ongoing process, too. It's not just one static impression. Mm -hmm. As we always, every day better, every code better, always try to put good provisions, better provisions in the code. Yeah, Yeah. so I'd like to be on your show and have a, a web show and videos that can continually update the industry. And a lot of these guys are working hard during the day. And if we can give them a five-minute clip at the end of the day that they can watch to, to learn a little more about the code, that would be, uh, I think we've received feedback that that would be more helpful than having people come in during the middle of a workday for a four-hour training. Yeah, Something absolutely. That you can watch online. Yeah, especially yeah. the millennials, yeah. Especially those millennials, <laughs> man. We'll walk around like this and they'll get educated about energy code and maybe transportation, too. 
Thank you, Ramsey. Ramsey yes. Brown, Hawaii Energy, energy engineer. Thanks. Really appreciate you coming down. Yeah, certainly. We're going to take a short break and uh, swap out, <laughs> and we'll be right back for more with uh, mm -hmm, Dave Rolf. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Two, one. Bingo, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And today we're talking with Dave Roth about energy and transportation. My co-host, uh, Mina Marita. Mina, can you introduce the scope of our discussion? Sure. So um, this month, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum is focusing on legislative issues. And we divided up the program into kind of three segments, the watchers, the doers, and the <laughs> makers. So the watchers being people like Dave who are at the legislature watching um, particular measures that they're interested in. Um, the makers, of course, the lawmakers, and the doers, the, the people that have to implement. So it was, our discussion last week was really interesting. We were looking at at it from one perspective, and it was mainly the um, renewable energy advocates. And one bill that surfaced is House Bill 1580, which um, setting benchmarks for uh, reaching a 100% re renewable energy goal in the transportation sector. And so we thought we'd have a different perspective today as um, Dave watch the progress of this bill, and um, while some of the renewable energy advocates have um, sort of intimated that this bill was killed in the waning hours of conference committee due to big business, um, you, you know, that's one perspective. Uh, you know, this was a pretty complicated bill, and, and I think the implementation was going to be challenging. So. We'd like to hear from Dave on your perspective of this bill. Well, they say that for every complicated problem, there's a simple solution that's wrong. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I, I was one of the watchers down there, but I represented a group that's the doers because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are, have ardently pursued trying to reach the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative goals. I mean, the mm -hmm. auto dealers, I work in representing them. And uh, this bill, 1580, set a goal of, I compared it to me doing a 15 foot high jump, and I mean it, it just would be impossible for me to hit a goal that high. Uh, the big business representative that you mentioned, uh, that Gary Slovin had an even more interesting uh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. He said that he plays tennis, and he said if he went to his tennis coach and said, you know, I want to play Wimbledon, coach me up to Wimbledon, his coach would say, get a different coach. But if he said, you know, I want you to improve my backhand, that they could do. Yeah. And so I guess I, I thought that was such a beautiful metaphor, mm -hmm. and I said, Gary, uh, Metaphors be with you. It's sort of a uh, Star Wars thing. <laughs> I heard so, it here on Think Tank. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I said that that's a good point. What could we do? How, mm -hmm. You know, how could we move the process forward? So that's what we worked on. 
Yeah, well, I think one of the difficult things or one of the chal challenging things about a bill like this is most, m this market is pretty, this sector is pretty much market driven and um, not regulated where, you know, these kinds of goals in the electricity sector may be a little bit more doable because you're talking about regulated industries. Um, for example, the electric utilities. So, how? Well, how that's such a perfect that? distinction because you, with the PUC, mm -hmm. you have a regulated in industry with regard to the utility mm -hmm. and the electric company, and so you could set down a bunch of regulations that would be needed to be required. Right, there were carrots but and we, we can't sticks. tell the customers to purchase the vehicles. That has that has to be a, a, a benefit of formula that works, mm -hmm. and and with gasoline, uh, you know, cheaper than water. I mean, I know, so when you think about it, it's going to be cheaper than water for as far as the eye can see. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the driving factors moving people over to the electric vehicle. And when gasoline prices went down, the barrel, uh, price of barrel of oil went down, uh, that dramatically changed the formula for the adoption of electric vehicles. And I started re changing my charts. And so I think a lot of the manufacturers are trying to wonder about that too. So it used to be uh, there were about 50% uh, cars and 50% trucks, vans, and SUVs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and now it's 60-40 with, you know, cars are down at 40% and the uh, SUVs pick up trucks and vans, which use more gasoline, but they have more attributes. They can carry more and they can haul and they have uh, other capabilities. Uh, people are buying those instead of the car. And so that's a big factor that's changing the adoption rate. The price of gas is changing the adoption rate. Uh, all sorts of things. And then the hydrogen car is coming up on the turn. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff, and the driverless cars coming on the turn faster than light speed. Well, and I think the other challenge here, too, is, you know, cars have anywhere from a 20-year lifespan. So the the change out of, of cars, and old cars never go away. They, they, they <laughs> live on and on and on. Uh, so well, it's beautiful that you said that. I've never heard anyone point that out, that there's mm -hmm. about a lifespan of about 20 years on a vehicle. So we sell about 50,000 new cars a year. But you know, about 50,000 go off to the crusher after 20 years. Mm -hmm. So they kind of go out the back end after 20 years, and they come in the front end, you know, imported in, into the islands because there's no manufacturing here. So uh, the number of cars on the roadway over the past 20 years, multiply that times 50, and you get an even million cars and trucks. And that's about what's going to stay on the roadways all the way through 2030, and I've just done a chart that says that same number will stay on all the way through about 2045, because people will be walking, uh, commuting more with electronics, and I uh, mean doing electronic commuting from home on computers, and, and they'll be you know located more closer to their work, and, and you're just not going to have the growth of cars that you've had over the past few years, and they're gonna, it's going to remain pretty constant. So is this a good time to bring up that I think we have a slide on... Yeah, we have, um, we have a chart that uh, Dave brought. Uh, can we see that chart? <coughs> well, this is a called well, the Golden let's, Gate. Let's take a look at yeah, it Golden, here. Golden Gate Bridge chart, we call it. And uh, okay, how about a shot of this? Yeah, it's uh, called the Golden Gate Bridge chart because it uh, resembles that famous bridge there in San Francisco. And and this is surprisingly enough the rhythm of car sales. They they go down to about thirty-five thousand. They climb all the way up to about seventy thousand. Then down to about 30, 000, 35 thousand again, up to about seventy thousand, then down and up, down and up, and it looks like the Golden Gate Bridge. And so, what drives it? It has to do with the price of housing. As as your house price continues to go up, people use the house as an ATM, and they pull out the money from the house and use it for the down payment, buy that new car, and all is going up in the house in the car industry and the housing industry together. Mm -hmm. When the housing industry levels off. People start to wonder, ooh, I wonder how my savings are going to hold out and everything. And so the number of car sales starts to drop off and it comes down it's the back end of the then. curve. Very directly related yeah, more than yeah. any other single It's factor. the big expenditures in your life. The two big ones. Yeah, right? yeah. But let me ask you this, David. We, you know, so the, the measure did not pass. And it's not clear that we have political will sufficient to actually get there with transportation. Transportation is, is a real challenge for clean energy. And indeed, transportation, last I knew, was uh, we were paying out $6 billion a year running out of the state for oil that comes from Indonesia and the like. Well, uh, $2 billion for the ground transportation sector. 
Okay. Yeah. Where's, that, where's the other? Six, then? What goes for air, 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 air airline okay. and, well, and marine? The two billion as we count. Uh, yeah, two billion. Well, marine is another. I hope we do another show on marine. That's another issue. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it's in the billions, and it'd be better at home. It'd be better for biofuel or anything else sure. or electric. And um, so you know, it's not it's not just an exercise to say we want to get into electric or hydrogen cars. Um, but people love their cars. I mean, people I know would never give up their cars. They would always buy a fossil fuel car, unless the price is just astronomical. And they would buy a big one, a truck, an SUV, as you said. So government has to step in. If we're going to do this, government has to step in. Government has got to make an incentive and disincentive combination of things to actually change the way the community, people, um, you know, spend their lives and their money. Um, and if we want to, you know, have clean energy and transportation, government has to act. So my question to you is, what exactly should government do? Leadership. Good management, good leadership is the art of making solutions and problems, rather, so interesting that people would want to participate in solving that and having the fun of doing it. So if you made that problem so interesting and, and cool to kind of work together to solve, I send a bunch of people uh, a million periods because there's a million people, uh, a million cars in, in the islands, and there's also a million people on Oahu. Well, if you page through a million periods on, on paper, you just are paging and paging and paging and paging and paging. That's all the cars there are. And to change them all to electric vehicles by 2045, it's almost well, mathematically like impossible. Said, yeah. 20 years is the useful life of because a car. Because the rotation out doesn't yeah, so allow it's, for it's them. It's hard to get rid of them is what happens. That's what happens. So what if I said, look, you want to have a fossil fuel car? It's going to cost you 500 bucks a year. And that's our way of telling you, that, you know, that, that government has a policy here and you better get rid of it. We're going to keep on doing and furthermore, after 10 years or five years, you know, it's going to be double that. And the longer you keep it, the more it's going to cost you. All of a sudden, you have an incentive that maybe means something. Well, you have a market disruption is what you have. And those things have okay as long as you get to your goal. Well, if, if, the, if the goal was participated in with everyone equally and, and felt it was fair to everyone, but if you start penalizing people because they had larger families or penalizing them because they had to have a truck and haul, that, haul things to work, there, there's a great deal of unfairness involved in that whole thing. So we've said... Don't let market disruption come in with things like that. We've even opposed uh, subsidies when, uh, when they said, let's put a bunch of subsidies on the electric car to get people to buy them. We said, no, uh, let's, let's let the electric car you know, live on its merits. Mm. And, uh, and I thought, you know, when I came aboard with the Auto Dealers Association, I set a goal of saving each dealer uh, around $40,000. And I was, it took me a number of years, but each year I can show the policies that we put in that saved them about 40000 per year in, in various policies. One was uh, eliminating a, a, a scrap tire tax at, at, at one point that after the scrap tires were cleaned up. I mean, so the tax has to go away, and Mina was involved in that and did a wonderful job as a, you know, the chair of the committee in those days. I, anyway, bottom line was if you can show people, if you could hand them uh, and say, here's $4,000 that I think you can have, because you won't have to buy gasoline, and I think that because you're going to have an economy that's like so had before. robust. Yes, that, so that you could now get, no, get $4,000 from the whole uh, making a change that would benefit you through yeah. moving to a variety of different ways of transportation. Uh, boy, that, that, Are you talking about the energy credit? Or, I mean, rather the electric uh, car credit? No, I'm, the, I'm just talking about, car credit. You no, I'm I'm talking talking about, about the government the handing it to The natural organic $4,000. The natural organic $4,000. Thank you. Okay. I like that. <laughs> I might use that, Jay. Natural organic $4,000. Yeah, well. Yeah. It, it should interest you as the bard of Bishop Street. <laughs> I'll take it. But I, I like that because it, it, it's free market. Mina, it's do free you market. Like that? I think you're in the same place. Free market $4,000. Yeah. Yeah. Natural <laughs> organic free market $4,000. But let me suggest to you that <clears throat> it's not likely to work. Is this what's called dead air? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, I'm pregnant. Uh, but pause. can you defend that? <laughs> Well, I just think people love I mean, their, their fossil fuel cars. We no, haven't, ex but, we but, haven't expanded. But let's go back to government mandates. You know, there's a transition going on here. You know, and are we jumping to renewable fuels or, or are we transitioning? Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of that transition is, you know, cars are a lot more fuel efficient. Um, in, in in the last decade, I mean we're 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 moving in a different direction with cars, and and technology is is just bearing down on us really quickly. Um, 
you know, one of my personal concerns is that, you know, we're focusing on a really small piece. We're not setting the stage for mm -hmm. transportation, mm -hmm. transformation. Um, you know, what is the role of autonomous cars in the future? I mean, are we opening up the door for that too? So there's, there's a lot of changes well, that's happening. A very interesting point. We, and you and I have talked about that before. Mm -hmm. I said, I said to Mina, uh, and one of our guests, I think I said, autonomous cars will bring 100% electric because an autonomous car is a highly computerized, you know, machine. And therefore, it's only likely, it's most likely, 100% likely, that the autonomous car, an electric phenomenon, will be an electric car. And whether you or somebody else said, not necessarily, Jay, because fossil cars are, you know, they're very high tech too. And you can have an autonomous car that is a fossil car. I wonder how you, and for that matter, the dealers feel about this. Well, excuse me, but I think you'll split the difference. I'm seeing an awful lot of car companies coming out with that electric vehicle aspect of it, but it has a gasoline vehicle backup range extender, so it kind of, the answer is both ways. Yeah. And by the way, that uh, driverless car is going to be here, you know, I can throw them on a pool from here to hit the, the, the date. <laughs> it's, it's 2020, 19 car makers are coming out with autonomous cars, driverless cars, by 2020. Now, we already had them at the auto show. I mean, we had a level one and level two. And so what there's that? five different levels of autonomy. The first one is, uh, well, the zero level is uh, the warning lights and things that you have just on the dash. But level one of autonomy is that it'll, it'll uh, have cruise control, but you still have your hands on the wheel. So it's hands on. Then level two is hands off, and it'll uh, change lanes and it'll do a number of other things. Actually, it will park itself. So that's level two. Level three is eyes off. You can actually watch a movie during level three. Level four is I can be in the back seat asleep, mind off. And level five is a robo taxi. I'm not even in the car. And there's no wheel. And there's no brakes. And it just runs around. So uh, five uh, levels. Uh, number five, I have this image. You want to send something, a gift maybe to your friend, your family. You put it in the car, have the car drive, and take it there. You don't have to be in the car at all. So, yeah. so before we run out of time, you know, my question to Dave is, okay, so we were at the early stages of getting a whole bunch of different interests at the table at the legislature. And... Um, discussing a vehicle, what's the next step, do you, do you think, to come up with good policy that moves us forward, moves, moves us forward, and um, what do you, how do you see that happening? Thank you. You know, to, to any hunter knows that to hit a duck in flight, you have to shoot ahead of the duck. Mm -hmm. So we're all sitting out here to say, let's shoot ahead of the duck, and here's what we have to do. First of all, you have to get control of the whole rail thing. That, 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 that sucks a lot of oxygen out of the room and takes away a lot of our uh, opportunities because money's fungible and if it's all sitting over here in this pile trying to solve that one point to point situation mm -hmm. I think that'll help a lot with development of housing and development of jobs and all sorts of things that's what it's supposed to do but solving traffic and solving all the other things that we have to do that'll have to come with cars and probably autonomous cars and eventually electric and hydrogen cars and so we have plans that shows how to do that I actually did the chart all the way up to 2045 mm -hmm. I didn't put in the uh, flying car which has now come across the, my desk faster than I ever anticipated I was an able Oh, it's up there. Uh, you know, uh, I was a naval aviator, but you know, uh, I there's our chart that shows you know the the rise and fall, the Golden Gate of uh, the uh, adoption, and you could see I said there would be 300 electric vehicles brought in 211. Well, I couldn't get it, couldn't get them here because uh, we didn't have them in the island. So I I, I phoned uh, Nissan, and they said, yeah, we'll make you the rollout market, and so most of those were you know, leaves, and then the next year was 675, and the next year we hit those numbers. But when we got to the 2016 and 17, we said we'd have to have a real push up to keep this going, and it would be a big education push. Mm -hmm. And we thought $3 million from Hawaii Energy, which was, you know, just sat here momentarily before, you could have this massive amount of information about the pile of benefits that comes to all of us as a society when we join in this gigantic effort to keep the money flowing in the islands. Well, Education, is that it? That's the driver. We, we don't incentivize or de-incentivize. We educate. don't tax or give credits. We educate. You educate. And everything, then the market stays smooth. Otherwise, you get like what happens with solar. Or the rooftop solar thing, it had all sorts of credits. When they dropped it, all of a sudden people were unemployed. And there were great disruption in the marketplace. And we've seen countless situations where there's big tax credits and everything taken away, and, and people are just left high and dry without jobs. Mina. We, we're we're going to leave on this high point <laughs> where it's not clear exactly what exact policy or implementation, but can you summarize this discussion? Where are we, you know, after talking with Dave? Where are we? Well, 
I think talking with Dave today, we've learned a little bit more about what the um, auto, auto dealers are up against. Um, we have a little bit more information about um, the car situation in Hawaii and you know what we can look forward to in the future, what, what the trajectory is for the future. So I think we have to be a little bit more realistic on how we approach and that we approach mm -hmm. in facts and always with um, our mindset on how we create the best market solution um, moving forward in, in this sector. Yeah, this is an interesting moment, even a tipping point moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And somehow, you know, that 1580, the failure of that bill, uh, you know, creates a challenge for everyone going I, forward. I wouldn't say it's a failure. Mm, I wouldn't it, say that either. It, I think it was good that we had that discussion. Yeah, and okay, the discussion well. has to happen, but we have to be more aware of the, the challenges moving forward oh. and really using fact-based information as we develop the policy yeah. and understand the market. Yeah. Um, that's key here. And deal with, the, deal with the distractions, which are, as you said, Dave, rail. We've and got to get. We've got to get that. What do you say? Under to, control. It has to be under control. I, I mean, and probably brought down on the ground and finished, and and so that you know we can move on. Uh, I just don't see how it can be finished with the dollars that are out there. It, it takes so many dollars away from all the other things, yeah. like charging stations and like hydrogen fueling stations and all the infrastructure. And I'll tell you, when the autonomous car comes in, it puts in those little small wave transmitters. That all has to go in on the on the utility poles. So, oh my goodness, I mean, that's, there's a lot of infrastructure that has to go in for the driverless car. Yeah. And remember, yeah, well, if you had the five, ten billion dollars, you could you'd put a lot of charging stations out there. Well, and I think, you know, again, this is another area where large investments have to be made um, to have that supporting infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we need right now is certainty. Um, you know, you, it, we can't be changing policies mm -hmm. every election cycle. Yeah. You know, these are long-term. Amen to that. These mm -hmm. are long-term investments that need to be made, and I sound like a broken record. No, no. <laughs> but um, that's that's why it's so difficult. Well, thank you, Mina Marita. Mina Marita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, Thanks, and now Dave. a blog writer with, uh, and a consultant with Energy Dynamics. Wonderful to have you here as co-host, and I'll see you again next week. And Dave Roth, Thanks. it's always great to talk to you, Dave. you, Dave. The part of Bishop Street oh. is so important for us to understand the nature of transportation in Hawaii. Thank you, Jay. Aloha.